Okay, so it is July the 6th, and we are on chapter 22 of the yearling. There are 33 chapters, so after tonight, we will only have 11 more chapters to go. I'm hoping to finish this book by the end of July. So, we shall see. So, let's get started. Chapter 22 of The Yearling. By November, the Baxters and the Foresters knew the extent of the plague and what to expect, both of the game and the predatory animals during the winter. The deer had been cut down to a fraction of their usual numbers. Where a herd of a dozen had fed across the edge of the clearing, a lone buck or doe leaped the fence into the cow pea field in search of food that was not there. The deer became bold, nosing in the old sweet potato beds for undiscovered nibbins, nubbins, sorry, undiscovered nubbins. The quail appeared in almost their usual numbers but the wild turkeys were decimated. From that fact, Penny concluded that the damage indeed lay somehow in the polluted swamp waters, for the turkeys fed there and the quail did not. All the food animals, deer and turkey and squirrel and possum, <coughs> were so scarce that a day's hunt might produce nothing. The unfriendly animals had suffered as heavy losses. As at first, Penny thought that this would be of advantage. It became plain almost at once that the result was to make the remaining killers hungrier and more desperate because of their own shortened food supply. He became alarmed for the Baxter Hargs and built a pen. Let me start that again. He became alarmed for the Baxter hogs and built a pen for them inside the lot. All the family went together to the woods and gathered acorns and scrub palmetto berries for the hogs. Penny set aside a measure of the new corn for fattening them. A few days later, a stamping and squealing sounded in the lot at midnight. The dogs, aroused, ran barking and Penny and Jody pulled on their britches and followed with a torch. The fattest barrow was missing. The kill had been so neatly that there was no sign of a struggle. Uh, the kill had been made so neatly that there was no sign of a struggle. A small trail of blood led across the lot and over the fence. It had required a large animal to kill and carry a heavy hog so handily. Penny took a hasty look at the tracks. Bear, he said, a big un. Old Julia begged to take the trail, and Penny himself was tempted, for the killer might be easily and quickly come up upon, gorging. But the night was dark, and the risk of an encounter if the bear should be shot and only wounded was, he decided, too great. The trail would still be fresh enough caught in the morning. They went back to bed to sleep lightly. At daylight, they called the dogs and set out. The track was that of old Slewfoot. Penny said, it I'd as good have knowed him. Of all the bears in the scrub, I'd have lived, it lived through the plague. Slewfoot had fed a short distance away. He'd eaten heartily and scratched a covering of trash across the carcass. Then he had gone south and crossed Juniper Creek. Penny said, he'll be back again to feed. A bear will stay a week with his kill. I've seen him fight off buzzards even when they didn't want to eat themselves. If twas every bear but this un, we could set us a trap. But no trap was made will fool him since he lost his toe in one. Can't we come wait for him and catch him at his feeding? We'll try. Tomorrow? 
tomorrow. They turned back toward home. A light galloping sound came closer and closer. Flag had broken loose and joined the hunt. He kicked up his heels and held his small tail erect. Ain't he a sight, Pa? He's a sight, son, all right. The next day, Penny was down with chills and fever. He was in bed for three days. There was no use in trying to catch old Slewfit now. Jody begged to go alone and watch for him in ambush, but Penny refused permission. The great bear was too wise and too dangerous, he said, and Jody was too rattle-headed. Ma Baxter said, Now I don't crave to feed them shoats to no bear, even if they ain't plum fat. When Penny, <coughs> excuse me, when Penny was able to leave the bed, they agreed that it was best to kill the hogs without waiting either for the full moon or for the animals to be properly fattened. Jody split fat wood and built a fire under the syrup kettle and brought water from the sinkhole to heat it in it. He tilted a barrel on its side and propped it up with sand. Then, when the water was exactly right, Ma Baxter ladled it into the barrel. Penny killed the hogs and scalded them one after the other in the barrel, twirling them by the legs with his quick deftness. Ma and Jody had to help him lift them to the cross trees for his strength suddenly failed him. All three worked furiously at the scraping, for the hair must come off before it set. Again, Jody marveled at the metamorphosis of live creatures in Tsum in whom he had felt interest and sympathy in the cold flesh that made acceptable food. He was glad when the killing was over. Now, scraping away on the smooth, firm hides, he enjoyed seeing his skin become clean and white. He began to anticipate the smell of sausage frying and of cracklings browning in the fat. Nothing was wasted, not even the entrails. The meat itself was dressed in, out into hams and shoulders, side meat and belly bacon, which would be cured with salt and pepper and brown sugar made from their own cane juice. And then smoke slowly over hickory coals in the smokehouse. There remained the hocks and feet, which would be pickled in brine, the ribs and backbones, which would be fried and put down in, uh, down in crocks under a protective layer of lard, the heads and livers and kidneys and hearts, which would be made into head cheese and put down the same way. The trimmings of lean meat would be ground into sausage. The fat would be tried out in the wash part and the lard put down in crocks and cans and the brown cracklings laid away for shortening in cornbread. The stomachs and intestines would be scraped and turned and soaked and then used for casings in which the sausage meat would be stuffed and the sausages hung in festoons and smoked along with the hams and bacons. Odds and ends would be cooked with cornmeal for the dogs and chickens. Even the tails were dressed. Only one part, like a windpipe, seemed without use and was tossed away. Jody asked, What's that, Ma? Why, that's his goozle. What's a goozle? Well, if he didn't have no goozle, he couldn't squeal. Eight hogs in all were dressed. Only the old boar hog, two young sows, and the brood sow, peace offerings from the foresters, were left to begin the cycle over again. These must take their chances in the woods. They would be fed the slops and a little corn at evening to toll them in their pen to be shut up at night for approximate safety. For the rest, they must root for a living, maintaining life if they could, dying if they must. Supper that night was a feast, and the table seemed to lavish long afterward. There would soon be collards in the garden behind the house, and wild mustard greens all about the clearing. There would be bacon to cook with them and with the dried shelled cow peas. Cracklings would hold out for crackling bread for months. The Baxters were in fair shape for the winter. 
The season was the most abundant of the year. The scarceness of game would not be so serious with the smokehouse full. The flattened sugar cane had sent out whiskered roots along the stalks and had to be torn free of the clutching earth. The stalks were like ragged mops. The extraneous roots had to be cut off before the cane could be ground. Jody drove old Caesar round and around the small cane mill and Penny fed the thin, fibrous stalks into the revolving gears. The yield was low and the syrup was thin and acid. But there was again sweetening in the house. Ma Baxter dropped oranges into the last boiling of syrup, and the result made a rich preserve. The corn was not much damaged, even the ears that had stood in the fields through the rains. Jody spent hours every day at the millstone. The lower stone had small grooves, that waved out from the center like the spirals on a snail shell. The upper stone rested on it, and the pair sat in a wooden frame with four legs. The shelled corn was fed into a hole in the center of the upper millstone, and when the ground meal reached a certain fineness, it sifted out through the waste hole and was collected in a bucket. Swinging the overhead lever in a circle, Hour after hour was monotonous, but not unpleasant. Jody dragged up a high stump, and when his back was tired, he sat, it, he sat on it by way of rest and variety. He said to his father, I do most of my figuring here. Penny said, I hope you do a heap of it, or the flood's done you out in a teacher. The Forsters and me had it settled to board a teacher, between us for you and Father Wing this winter. When Father Wing died, I still figured I'd do some trapping and get cash money that away. But the creatures is so scarce now, and the hide's so poor, it's no use, Jody said comforting, comfortingly. That's all right. I know a heap now. That just proves your ignorance, young fella. I do hate for you to grow up and not know nothing. You'll just have to make out this year with what little I can learn you. The prospect was more than acceptable. Penny would start him on his reading lesson, or his sums, and then, before either of them knew it, it would be off on a tail. Jody went on with his grinding with a light heart. Flag came up and he stopped to let the fawn lick the meal at the waste hole. He often took a taste himself. The stones became hot from friction, and the meal smelt like popcorn or corn pone. When he was hungry enough, a mouthful was palatable, but it never tasted as good as it smelled. Flag was bored with the inactivity and wandered away. He was becoming bolder and was sometimes gone in the scrub for an hour or so. There was no holding him in the shed, he had learned to kick down the loose board walls. Ma Baxter expressed the belief, only because it was her hope, that the fawn was going wild and would eventually disappear. Jody was no longer even troubled by the remark. He knew that the same restlessness came to the fawn that came to him. Flag merely felt the need of stretching his legs and exploring the world about him. They understood each other perfectly. He knew, too, that when Flag wandered away, he moved in a circle and was never out of hearing of Jody's call. That evening, Flag got himself a seri in serious disgrace. The sweet potatoes had been cured and heaped in a pile on the back porch. Flag roamed there while everyone was occupied and found that by butting the pile, the potatoes wouldn't roll. Oh, uh, would roll. The potatoes would roll. The sound and motion charmed him. He butted the pile until it was strewn over most of the yard. He tramped on the potatoes with his sharp hooves. The odor enticed him, and he nibbled one. The taste pleased him, and he went from one to another nibbling. 
Ma Baxter discovered him too late. Grave damage had been done. She drove him furiously with a palmetto broom. The game was much one, much the one of chase that Jody played with him. When she turned away, he turned as well, and following, butted her in, the, in her ample rear. Jody came in from his grinding to a hullabaloo and a crisis. Even Penny upheld Ma Baxter in the gravity of the matter. Jody could not endure the expression on his father's face. He could not keep back the tears. He said, I didn't know what he was doing. I know, Jody, but the harm's as bad as to, as bad to the taters as if he done it for meanness. We got scarcely enough rations now to do the year. Then I'll eat no taters and make it up. Nobody wants you should do without taters. You just got to keep track of that scrapper, that scaper. If you keep him, it's your place to see he don't do no damage. I couldn't watch him and grind corn all too. Then keep him tied good in the shed when you can't watch him. He hates that old dark shed. Then pin him. Jody rose before the day the next morning. Jody rose before day the next morning and began to work on a pen in the corner of the yard. He studied its position with an eye to using the fence for two corners of the pen and to having it where he could see flag from most of his own work spots, the millstone, the wood pile, and the barn lot in particular. Flag would be content, he knew, if he was inside of him. He finished the pen in the evening when his chores were done. The next day, he untied Flag from the shed and lifted him into the pen, kicking and struggling. Flag was over the bars and out and at his heels again before he reached the house. Penny found him in tears. Don't get so swivet, boy. We'll work this out one way or t'other. Now, the taters is near about the only thing he'll bother. Do you keep him out in the house? They'd ought to be under cover right anyway. Now you take down that tippity tumbly pen and build a coop to cover the taters, like a chicken coop with two sides coming to a peak. I start you on it. Jody wiped his nose on his sleeve. I sure am obliged, Pa. With the potatoes bedded and covered, there was no more serious trouble. Flag had to keep out of had. Flag had to be kept out of the smokehouse, as well as the house, for he had grown so large that by rearing on his hind legs, he could reach the hanging sides of bacon and lick the salt. Ma Baxter said, I don't want nobody but me licking the meat I eat, let alone a nasty creature. Flag was annoyingly curious as well and butted over a can of lard in the smokehouse to hear the cover fall and see what was inside. The day was cool and the thin loose lard was discovered before it had run out, but such intrusions could be taken up simply by keeping the door shut, as was desirable in any case. Jody developed a good memory for such details. Penny said, It'll do you no harm to learn to be careful. You got to le to learn taking care of rations comes first of all, first after getting them. And that's the end of chapter twenty two of the year. Just wanted to say if you've not subscribed to my channel, please do so and don't forget to. Press on the bell so you get notifications of when I read again. Also, if you would like to be in support of this channel, please go to my Patreon page that's listed in the comments below or in, in the box below and su subscribe to my uh, Patreon account. If you only have a dollar a month, it would 
certainly be very helpful. Thank you so much, and until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace.